Joe Buck, kind enough to call in prior to game two after last night's broadcast from Kansas City. How are you, Joseph? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm doing fine. I don't know where to begin with you. Um, let's start with let's start with the Volquez stuff first, Joe, because that's what a lot of people are talking about this morning. Uh, when when did Fox hear about the fact that Volquez's dad had passed away? Uh, really, I feel like it was pretty close to just before first pitch, mm-hmm. and I think that uh, we were alerted to it the way a lot of people in this world get alerted to it through social media. I think Kenny Rosenthal, who monitors all that stuff, I'm kind of tapped out on that once uh, once the game starts to get rolling, mm-hmm. uh, was on it, knew about it. And then the question was, do you report it? And uh, the Kansas City Royals told us uh, that it was the wish of Edinson's wife that he not be told until after his start. And so their PR director, Mike Swanson, uh, was in contact with Pete Macheska, our producer, and said, you know, that that's the plan for the Kansas City Royals. As you know, Rich, they have TVs on in the clubhouse. How else can they second guess everything we say? Right. Uh, and so we determined, decided uh, from Pete Macheska, our producer, really throughout that we were going to respect those wishes. Um, there are certain things that I think you have to report. In this day and age, there are certain things that are newsworthy. Uh, that's not one of them to me. Uh, nobody's waiting around to find out the health of Edinson Volquez's father. And if you are the Royals, hoping that he doesn't know, or Edinson's wife, or most importantly, Edinson himself, that's not the way you want to find out that your father passed away, through talk on a television set from baseball announcers doing a baseball game. So... I, I don't know if there's controversy that we didn't talk about it, but that's not our job. And this is a guy's father, and uh, this is how the Royals wanted us to approach it, and that's fine. That That's kind of in its own separate category. That, that, that's how we approached it, and that's how I would do it every time. Yeah, uh, I'm with you too, Joe. And it, I guess at some point, though, once he came out of the game, uh, you did address that there was something that was going on and, and announced that Fox had made a decision not to report it. Correct? Was that part? Yeah, no, we did. And uh, then we went down to Ken Rosenthal. He said the story, and then you move on. But but to act as if, you know, how dare we withhold the information from the viewing public that Edinson Volquez's father had passed away, even though Edinson himself didn't know about it, then it's not a story. If he knew about it, Mm. then it's a story and something that you have to – you have to report because that obviously would weigh on any human being as they were out there trying to win a game against the Mets in the World Series. But he wasn't aware of it, and we certainly weren't going to break it uh, in case somebody heard it in the clubhouse uh, and and decided to tell Edinson or Edinson heard it himself. So that's I would do that 100 out of 100 times. Has anything ever close to this, anything like that ever crossed your mind or your plate prior to a broadcast or during a broadcast ever? Ever heard of anything no, like this, Joe? No, because I think the, the the interesting part of it was that he wasn't aware and it was his wife's decision, from what I'm told, at least mm-hmm. what I was told last night, that it was his wife's decision not to tell him. So, no, I mean, not even close. Typically you have, and we've had instances, I can't think of any off the top of my head, where, You know, well, Chris Young had it himself earlier in the year where his father passed away on a Saturday night and he took the ball on Sunday and told Ned Yost that he wanted to pitch. That's the way his dad would have wanted it. And so these things do happen. These people are human beings with families and, uh, but, but not one where the guy didn't know. And since he didn't know, that's that's not our job to break it on TV. I, I, and if anybody has any problem with that, I mean, I, I, I refuse to believe the world was waiting and needed to know that information in the first inning as opposed to the seventh. Mm-hmm. It's it's irrelevant to the to the big picture if the guy himself doesn't know. Joe Buck joining me here on the Rich Eisen show, and then in the fourth inning, you're in the middle of a promo for the Grinder, and then I imagine at some point. Did your headsets go out, or did somebody, did Macheska from the truck tell you, by the way, we're off the air right now, Joe? No, I mean, we, we couldn't even talk to the truck. He, Pete Macheska, our producer, and I just started texting, and he's asking me if they're still playing. 
And uh, it was just, I guess, pitch black in the truck. Everybody got out because the generator blew. And they were worried that it was a hazardous situation. Again, from what I'm told, I'm not down there then, obviously. And, and so they evacuated the truck. And then it was, well, what the heck's going on? First, they stopped the game because the managers were alerted to the fact that New York didn't have a feed, uh, so there would be no replay. And they stopped. And then Terry Collins was justifi- justifiably livid because Matt Harvey's just standing out there on the mound. Eventually, the managers agreed to play without replay ability. And so then it was surreal because then you're watching the game. And even though the MLB Network International feed is on, they're watching the World Series Game 1 in Trinidad, but they're not watching it in Omaha because it's not on Fox. So the game restarted, and they're playing it, and it's not on TV. So we were literally the only people in the United States, as as much as I can tell, that we're watching this World Series game that was, like, happening in a vacuum somewhere. And so you're just, like keeping score just to stay in the game as a broadcaster? For a while, I just started doing it into the dead headset just because I didn't know if if maybe you could hear me on your TV, but I just couldn't hear myself. So for a little while, we just kept doing the game, and it, that was odd. And then uh, eventually, yeah, we just kept score and then had the weirdest moment of all of it going over to the MLB Network International booth and tapping Matt Vesgurgeon and John Smoltz on the shoulder because that's how Fox wanted it. Uh-huh. That well, we're taking over here, and that that I texted both those guys today and said that you know that that was odd at best and uncomfortable. And thanks for being so cool about it. And they were laughing about it, so that wasn't an issue, but it could have been. And so you eventually got a text saying, "Let's get you over to the the MLB Network International feed booth because that's working. We'll tap into it for." the broadcast for Fox, and then at some point everything got back, was normalized, and you went back to your respective booths? Is that essentially yeah, what happened, Yeah, everything sounded normal, looked normal, the headset sounded great. Um, yeah, it just was oh, back gosh. up, and I, I think the phenomenal part of the story is that we were back up within a half hour from a complete power outage with all those cameras and all the microphones and all the technology junk that's going into a game there it was, popped back up, and, you know, it, I guess America missed a few of the pitches, but none of the real action. So I, I thought it was a good scramble job by everybody to get those pictures up and then to get our truck back. No doubt. And then you called 10 more innings because you saw yeah, it. No, that's the thing. I mean, it's like, uh, okay, and then you come back and you're thinking, well, we just missed a big chunk of the game. No, we didn't. We <laughs> have another three hours to go. Unbelievable, Joe. I mean, think about it. And and then the way that the extras was, was brought about with a home run, Brocious, which you called in 2001, was the last guy to do that. If you want to, you want to then make it just a game one that featured something like that. You're talking about Gibson's home run in '88 was the last time there was a game tying home run in a game one. I mean, or game or go ahead home run, obviously. Unbelievable, Joe. And you, you never know in this business, do you? Right? No, you don't. I mean, you, and think of how the game ended. The game ended with Bartolo Colon being stretched out. This guy's 42. Uh, let's just say nicely he doesn't have the most athletic body uh, going, and he's ageless and has a rubber arm. I mean, he's, he's incredible. And Chris Young throws not only three shutout innings, but I'm looking at the numbers, didn't give up a hit, walked one, struck out four, including striking out the side when he came on in the 12th inning, this is a 6'10 right-hander who throws 89, 90 miles an hour at best, and he had him tied in knots. I mean, you just – you could never go into that game – forget the power outage, that's a freak thing – but you could never go into that game thinking that that those are the guys that are going to determine who wins game one of a best-of-seven series. And it started with an inside-the-park home run, too, right? And the guy- Oh, yeah, by the way, there was that. Too. Right, and yeah. in the game, Young was won by, as you mentioned, he his dad passed away, and he almost had a start because the, the starting pitcher's dad had passed away. I mean, this you can't make it up, Joe. You can't no, make it up. It, it is one of those. If somebody turned in a script, they would get it back with, like, yeah. come on, let's let's make it more realistic. Right. Now you got game two tonight between DeGrom and uh, Cueto. That's that's going down tonight on Fox. 
and you're, you're going weak- down for real. That is indeed. And by the way, by the way, I love that song. Um, your week started with Greg Hardy going crazy on the sideline too. I mean, you've had, yeah, and we missed, I know they blew it up on NBC. Uh, you know, I, I think at some point you can only cover so much camera wise. We sure. missed, we only caught the end of it. We were like officials at the end of a fight, just seeing Des Bryant get involved. And we highlighted that we've seen Des Bryant do that seemingly 20 times getting in somebody's face coming off the field. And you right. go, Oh, well there's Des Bryant doing his thing. And you know, he's lucky Hardy didn't plant him in the second deck. And then you look at the beginning of it and you go, well, there's Greg Hardy doing his thing. And he's, you know, getting into it with Rich Basaccia, the special teams coach, uh, you know, and then there's Jerry defending him. And it just, that thing's going to get ugly before it, it gets better. You have a feeling uh, with, with Greg Hardy, he's just he, a little out of, well, a lot out of control. Right. What a week you've had, Joe. Great job on, on both. What a week I'm having. Unbelievable. And by the way, uh, uh, next time you read a grinder promo, do it at your own peril, okay? Because oh, I will. Blame it on I, Rob I Lowe. Found out, I just found out that Rob Lowe has asked for my cell number, so I don't know if he's going to yell at me <laughs> because I made fun of it when we got the picture back up. I said it's the curse of Rob Lowe and uh, or Fred Savage. Yeah, so. that's right. Well, look, if Rob's calling you, that's fine. If Fred Savage calls you, you know you're getting called on the carpet, Joe. I'm okay? a dead man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for calling in, Joe. I really appreciate All right. it. Wow. Sure, we'll see. Thank you. You bet. That's Joe Buck, who, by the way, his new show, Undeniable, will be right here on uh, DirecTV Audience Channel 239 or on Uverse 1114, debuting on November 18th. He's got Gretzky. He's got uh, Jeter, Jerry Jones, Troy Aikman, some of the best in the business he will be sitting down with. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience.